Good afternoon, everyone. Rich Swabinski with the Mortgage Collaborative here with the last week in mortgage today, our weekly walk through all the latest news and relevant information for the mortgage industry. And each week, I'm pleased to be joined by one of our lender members as my co-host. And this week, TMC fan favorite, the SVP and Director of Mortgage Banking for Armed Forces Bank. And we'll get into that a little bit, formerly KS State Bank. Oh Cameron Mott. Cam, good to see you, man. Good to see you, Rich. And if you could Thanks start by uh, telling our audience just a little bit about Armed Forces Bank, really unique and cool organization. And, uh, uh, you know, some of the news that started to develop late last year uh, with, I guess, your former organization, kind of former same. But if right. you could set the table for the listeners by telling us a little bit about the bank and the mortgage operation. So I guess to start, let's, I was with KSA Bank, you know, running the mortgage division uh, for over 10 years. And then in October, we announced that uh, our forces bank was going to acquire the KSA Bank folks, just the mortgage division, not the bank. So they're still banking in Arizona and Kansas. Um, and that whole thing went down December 2nd. Uh, so since then, uh, we've been trying to transition. What does it mean? Because our forces bank itself um, is is just a part of the Dickinson Financial Corporation. Just under that umbrella, we have a sister bank, it's Academy Bank. So our forces bank, we have on or near you know, military installations, we have about 19 of them nationwide. And then we have about 126 regional uh, branches for Academy Bank, right? And those are in the Kansas City Metro, the Denver, Colorado Springs, and you know, Phoenix Scottsdale areas. So kind of different different banking philosophies and, and things, but they all fit under that Dickinson financial umbrella. So we're really the same same company, but we have to get different approvals for everything that we do. So most of our street, let's call it retail conventional kind of guys may take on the Academy Bank persona, even though they both will have the NMLS uh, in, in case they need to originate a loan under Armed Forces Bank for any reason. And the same way with Armed Forces Bank. So that's mostly, you know, our government heavy folks, maybe that need to be supplemented more so with leads, you know, lead generation versus more of a self-gen. Um, and as we've spoke about before, Rich, you know, I really run more of a hybrid. I don't have a, you know, consumer direct uh, office or a call center or anything of that regard. But uh, right now we are, we are transitioning. We finally figured out what we wanted to do. We had, you know, the existing our forces uh, academy bank mortgage team and then we had the formerly ksb team and since uh, i think it was march the end of march i think it was at the ice conference actually which we're going to talk about later it was uh, determined that i was going to go ahead and lead all of sales all of marketing and uh, all of secondary so now we got to get everybody out of one encompass you know out of their encompass into our encompass which also leaves us with a new point of sale system for us, they're going to be using Blend instead of Consumer Connect. They're going to be using SnapDocs instead of whatever Ellie Docs was. So there's a lot, a lot of moving uh, pieces and parts. Hopefully, we'll be done by the end of May. But uh, you know, who knows? It's the mortgage industry. Everybody's throwing curves at us. Never a dull moment. Never a dull moment. I, can't, I, can't I just imagine just trying to trying to merge all that together because guys at KS built up a, a very nice size mortgage operation under your leadership, man, really grew that thing these last three, four years. I remember when you told me the news, I did a little Google research on armed forces, cool organization, military bank and uh, branches like on bases. And uh, I think it's at the time they, tr the acquisition of KS, your organization tripled their, their mortgage lending operation, kind of going all in on mortgage, bringing you and your team, into the fold. Uh, so I, I can't even imagine, yeah, all the merging things together fun the, the, that you're going through. Yeah, it did. It's a whole different mindset from the bank side. You know, when I came from a bank where we were kind of, um, you know, the devil said I had to have a mortgage division uh, versus, you know, Dickinson Financial Academy Armed Forces Bank. They want us, right, to diversify what they have. So that's nice. It's nice to be, you know, part of the team. Awesome. Awesome. You mentioned Compass and ICE, and let's just start there because huge acquisition news last week. Mm -hmm. uh, ICE, the owner of Ellie May and Compass, <clears throat> announces a deal to acquire 
Black Knight, $13.1 billion deal. You've been an Encompass guy for some time now. I just uh, wonder your, your initial thoughts and, and reaction when you saw that news break. Um, when I initially saw it, I was glad it wasn't Black Knight buying ice, um, to be honest, instead ice. That just means, you know, we're going to get less servicing than we have. But uh, I'm more concerned about, uh, are they going to start trying to force Optimal Blue on us and some other Black Knight components that we don't use or don't want to use? Uh, so that becomes very interesting. Or is there a co-mingling? I don't know if you remember back when Encompass bought, was it Data Track or, you know, I'm talking about, yep. you know, they acted like, well, we're going to allow you to go ahead and flow through and use that. And then at the end of the day, they didn't, right? Everybody had to conform over to Encompass. So. Hopefully it's that direction versus having to go through, I forget what Black Knights is, Empower, isn't that right? Empower? Empower, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so well. Be some of that, that kind of struggle. I think they're going to be able to manage two different LOS systems with the same. So I think we're going to have time at the least. I mean, I, I think a year is everything I've kind of seen and heard. In a best case scenario, a year for this thing to get finalized. Right. Until then, obviously, they're going to continue to operate as standalone companies. And, you know, I'm sure it's likely to go through some antitrust and monopolistic uh, scrutiny, just given the market share of uh, Black Knight servicing system and the market share of Encompass and, uh, you know, just what that would do. In theory, though, you would think, I mean, it, you know, mortgage, I talk all the time about costs and you know technology isn't bringing costs down and mm -hmm. one good positive byproduct of an acquisition like this is hopefully in theory that uh you know a, a bigger larger company could help drive costs down to their customers um but we'll see long long road to hoe on this one <clears throat> i would hope i would say that's not the way it's been through the encompass sales over the years um you know it's done nothing to get more expensive the bigger the company you know has gotten so yeah, well, I will. Uh, I'll be cautiously optimistic, Rich. <laughs> That's good. Good. Good way to put it. Cautiously optimistic. Um, mortgage rates actually a little relief these last couple of days. Believe it or not, I, it's the first time I've actually been able to utter that line in months. Uh, you know, I think it's because you know bonds are probably railing just out of uh, sheer terror of. A potential recession in, in the Fed madness from last week uh, brought up in my share screen. That's the 10 year treasury yield these last three years. Uh, you know, we see during the pandemic uh, what, what happened with rates, but the ascent since the beginning of March to mortgage rates, kind of crazy. It has been crazy. Uh, I think, you know, more shocking than to us, right, would be to the consumer. Because you're quoting them something at the beginning of the week and something, you know, that could have been a quarter to a half point higher by the end of the week, the way they've been moving. So it's nice to get a little bit of reprieve. But I think, you know, we didn't see, you know, an increase. So I think people are still stunned. Now, today will probably be a really, really good lock day. Yesterday was just okay. But today should be much better. Now that everybody's kind of off their heels. It's everybody, I think, is reeling from what's going on right now, not really knowing you know, what's going to happen next or how to, uh, how to counteract it. And you're probably going to bring up home affordability next. It's we're going there. Oh, for sure. But it's, it's not surprising to hear you say that you had a pretty good lock day yesterday and are expecting another, another good one today, just because so much news about rates in general, if it's mortgage rates or the feds policy on their interest rates, that you get a little reprieve and a, a little bump down in rates like we've seen these last couple of days. And it sounds like uh, you're saying it's shaking some people off the fence, which doesn't surprise me. Yeah, it has. It's the same way, you know, when all of a sudden they spike up, it shakes people off the fence. And then you hope that you're not going to get this, you know, fallback that kind of typically happens, especially after holidays. So it's going to be interesting what, you know, Memorial Day is going to bring as we go into and as we come out of we got a couple of weeks here to see if things can stabilize or, you know, is it more of the same? There's still such strong demand for housing, given the affordability challenges, the higher interest rates. I'm sure it's the same in your neck of the woods as it is in Northeast Ohio. 
every house that goes on the market is getting gobbled up quickly despite higher rates and mm -hmm. low affordability. And uh, this demand, like I think most economists and people that project things and look at the housing industry, they really expected that what's happened with rates and home prices would have slowed things down, slowed down the demand by now. Thus far, it really hasn't happened. I was reading a column this morning, kind of preparing for this, and it was somebody again from realtor.com. Oh, we're starting to see, you know, people lowering their, their home prices. And I've read this same column from realtor.com at least 10 times in the last 10 months where they're predicting that values are going to start to drop. And, um, it, but it hasn't, it hasn't really happened because, no. right. There's this just strong underlying demand for people to buy houses. That's just purging through all these impediments. So well, even in, you know, Manhattan, Kansas, they're still selling for over sales price. You know, you're going to get three to eight offers by the end of the day. So you, you put your sales price at something reasonable and you're going to get, you know, substantially more. I mean, I think even in the, you know, 200 to $300,000 range, they're getting at least 30 grand more than what they asked for, which is, you know, kind of unheard of, especially here. But I guess the beauty of Manhattan, Kansas also, we're in a college town as well as, you know, we're right, we're next door neighbors to Fort Riley. So every two to three years, we've got people PCS and out. So there's, you know, we don't necessarily, it's, we're still, we're still building houses, but they're not building them fast enough. So there's, you know, the de supply versus demand is still an issue, but I mean, we really don't see the low lows when that isn't an issue. There's always people, we're moving people in uh, very quickly for both instances. And we also have the, uh, what is it called? The, the new Agra disaster. This is the last yeah. week in mortgage today. I'm Rich Swarbinski with the Mortgage Collaborative. This week joined by the SVP, Director of Mortgage Banking for Armed Forces Bank, Cameron Mott. Cam, we were bouncing back and forth this morning on email uh, column I sent you over, which was funny. And, but when I read it, it started to make sense. People are buying homes and then renting out rooms, you know, so you can afford, you know, maybe you can't afford the home you want, but you want to buy a new home um, because of rates and prices. So people are buying houses, a trend starting to develop nationally and, and renting out a room to somebody like uh, Airbnb style to uh, help make that, that monthly mortgage payment that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to afford. I guess surprising, not surprising. I'd say it's not surprising. I don't see you know, I don't see it in the Midwest all that often, but it's not surprising at all, right? People have to make their ends meet. So it's it's still better than renting because the price of price of rents have you know gone up significantly. So at least they have home ownership and they can get uh, I, I read the same article. You know, a lot of people they even if they can't afford it, they're getting that just to put down on principle due to the higher rates and, and everything, just to kind of, you know make sure that they're uh, more liquid in their home. I mean, if you're like a young couple just out of college, maybe not a job yet, or, you know, an entry level job, cause you're right. Rents talks about you know, home values and home prices and, you know, multiple bids over asking, but what's going on with rent prices month over month, especially these last five or six months, it's, it is a horrible deal right now to rent a house. <laughs> it really is. I mean, really like is. where I'm at in Cleveland, like a crappy house is 2,500 a month. I mean, and they were a pretty low, you know, can't like pretty, pretty reasonable cost of living part of the country. And, uh, you know, that's considered an exorbitant mortgage payment, at least uh, where I live. No, for sure. And I think that's what we're seeing, you know, even in the apartments, you know, if you wanted to have a one bedroom or two bedroom, you're looking anywhere from 1,400 you know, 2,200. And uh, that gives you all kinds of neighbors, not necessarily the ones that you need. <laughs> Unless you're that college kid that's in Aggieville, you know. <laughs> um, also last week, Cameron, the, both the, I had the, we had the president of the National Association of Home Builders on uh, the rundown with Robin Rich last Friday. He's really a tell it how it is guy. Holy cow. And, uh, yeah, the, the, the home builders and the National Association of Realtors, both in D.C. on Capitol Hill last week, pleading with lawmakers for some help 
with the housing supply issue. Uh, mm -hmm. Your thoughts on just, you know, you know, I, I think like me, you tend to be not a big government guy, but I mean, in, in your opinion, this, the housing supply issue right now in America, is this something that can work itself out by itself? Are we going to need government intervention to help get us out from under, out of the hole we're in right now? And if so, is there any chance they do it effectively? Well, let's start with the end. Will they do it effectively? No. Right. Um, you're right. I'm not, easy I don't want a big brother in my business. Um, every time they get into it, you know, they over tighten, uh, then they have to over loosen. It just, it, it's never done timely. It's always more reactive than, you know, being proactive. So can they help? They can help, but I'm not sure that they're going to solve it. I think it's something that's got to resolve itself, you know, just with time, with time, people actually coming back into the workforce. I know the unemployment numbers are low, but why are, if, if employment is so low and so great, then why are all these ships, you know, with all these containers sitting on both coasts waiting to be offloaded, you know, and, and brought to their final destination. That's one of the biggest issues that we have, you know, with supply. And then that just since it's harder to get what the cost of everything, the cost of goods has gone way up. You know, if they want to do anything, they need to make it self-sustainable. Right. Don't uh, sign executive orders or take executive orders away that are going to make us less sustainable on oil. Right now, what, where do we get most of our oil from? Well, we get it from terrorists and from a country that's communist that is attacking the Ukraine. So then you put a sanction on them. So we're not going to get any more oil. So where are we going to get it from? It just costs us more money. Um, I, I just those kind of things. Right. Sometimes, you know, Simon Simple works. Uh, sometimes you need to do a little more analysis. In this case, I think uh, I think there's been more politically done because they can or because they want to versus what's really good for the country and the common good of the people. Yeah, good point. Mm -hmm. Other typically too soon, too late, too extreme, not enough, because they, they don't intimately understand the issues and uh, the way that business owners would approach something. And I, I think a good example of that is the federal reserves interest rate policy these last couple of years like I remember talking on this show nine months ago you know because a lot of people were coming out publicly like why the hell is the fed still buying the living crap out of the mortgage bond market why are they buying billions and billions of dollars of mortgage bonds each week it, it, it and you know what they're doing by doing that is you know they were in their mind helping keep mortgage rates low which would help make home purchases more affordable and uh, would allow people to refinance and uh, in the lower payments, that money could be put back into the economy. But you look now at the extremes to which they just bought the living crap out of just trillions of dollars of mortgage bonds. And now they're trying to unwind that from their balance sheet. And that's been a big part of the run up in rates that now people can't buy a house because <laughs> it's because they're going to run out of room of it if they want to buy it because the unwinding of the balance sheet um, is is having an even more negative effect than to the able to benefit of what they were they were doing to get us here. Yeah, well, it's it's kind of worse than taper tantrum, right? Because there's so many other forces that we're dealing with now. It's not just you know, them trying to unwind that. So yeah, I don't. I mean, what's the right answer, right? They should have put so much money in when they did back in 2020. We know that. I should have helped with liquidity with the servicers as we were going through COVID and, you know, the forbearance and forbearance, you should have had a reason. I mean, those three things probably would have stopped a lot of this or at least delayed some of it. Uh, you know, the other thing is, is I'm not sure if all the states are even done with the stimulus, um, you know, so there's, a, that's probably part of the unemployment problem. I don't have all the answers, Rich. I just work hard. Yeah. Uh, you know, I roll with the punches. They keep doing something and it, you know, you just have to, I think you have to be flexible and uh, be able to pivot in mortgage to react to all the craziness going on. It really is. This industry, as a leader like yourself, you have got to be able to turn on a dime. I mean, think about the beginning of the pandemic uh, went from like, you know, March and April margin calls and people terrified that uh, their bit, they were going to be out of business to sending your whole staff remote overnight to just the floodgates of refinance 
And now we, it, it's just, it's always something. And you kind of look back and what everybody thought a year ago would be happening now is never accurate in the mortgage industry. <laughs> right. No, we knew, right? The fun was, was, had to end. We knew rates were, had to go up. I think just the severity of it and everything, you know, politically, um, you know, just or globally that has happened. It's just been one big ball of mess. One big ball of mess. And uh, I see our friend Rob Crisman in the chat notes that uh, $1.33 billion loss in the fourth quarter for Finance of America owned by uh, Blackstone. And uh, yeah, the uh, uh, mortgage industry as an investment, uh, if you're Blackstone and you own companies or you're a shareholder of any of the public ones, uh, it's been a, been a rocky road. It's going to be interesting. Will we see more consolidation? Probably. Others exit the market. I think those will make it through this. A year like this, we always say that, right, whenever it's down. Anybody that can make it through a year like this is going to make it forever. But uh, this is probably the toughest market, you know, in my over 20 years I've seen. It's tough. So, yeah, it's yeah. just uh, the, the headwinds right now are <clears throat> extreme and coming from a lot of different directions and um but you know one thing i've heard here at the i'm at the mid-atlantic regional conference at national harbor maryland just outside dc and um you know i think that uh you know it spawns opportunity for companies uh talk with a few of our bank members that are here that have had some good success recruiting right now um you know i think independent mortgage banks have grown market share from over the last 10 years, basically 30% to 70%. And a lot of advantages in this last cycle for them. But this type of climate right now, man, you're a bank, you got some home equity product, you got some portfolio product, maybe a little construction product. Uh, you're a division of a bank that, you know, in this interest rate climate like this one, other divisions of the bank make a little bit more money. Mm -hmm. Banks a lot of times complain, oh, we're not as nimble, we're not this, we're not that. But this is the benefit right now, being a depository back lender uh, being in these type of climate and wouldn't surprise me to see depositories take back some market share these next few years. I think you'll see that, you know, I know we we're doing a lot more HELOCs rather than cash outs because it does make more sense. Some of the borrowers won't qualify, you know, to do the cash outs with the higher rates. So uh, doing a HELOC for them makes sense. Of course, you know, you have to worry about the geographical restrictions. Um, for us, you know, we tried to lend wherever our footprint is and then really try to be nationwide. But, you know, for things such as bridges, we need to stay in the markets that we're knowledgeable in and not get out, uh, you know, too far ahead of our skis. And then just make sure that we're not going to see a collapse. Do I think there's going to be one? No, but we can't keep, you know, having the appreciation that we are. It's got to slow down at some point. So, are we going to do, you know, an eighty-nine point nine uh, CLTV HELOC? Not in all areas. I guess is the right answer. It's smart, you know. Uh, you know, I worked with banks my whole life. They they still have short memories of the the last downturn, oh seven, oh eight. You get caught with assets at 95 percent, and all of a sudden they're one hundred and ten, hundred and twenty percent. That's just. A disaster for banks and mm. not worth the risk of you know uh, does anybody see some huge bubble coming anytime soon probably not because demand for housing is still strong but uh i can tell you right now home values are up 30 percent the last two years and and th that just historically uh something's got to give at some point right so, uh question in the uh q a from our good friend kyle johnson from first security bank the unwinding causes lots of secondary and tertiary consequences and seems to be too much of a reaction when coupled with the rise in Fed rates. Seems like a bit of an overreaction. Do either of you see this settling down in the near future or is the Fed going to continue the course they are on? Any thoughts on that, Cam? I think they're gonna continue the course that they're on um, until they see something, you know, improve inflation. I think as long as inflation stays high, they're gonna continue the course they're on and hoping that that's gonna resolve it knowing that, you know, we're probably already, they're throwing us into a recession. So at what point do we see lower rates? I mean, I, I would say, what do they say? It's usually a, a year after 
that you're in the full recession before you actually notice that it's a recession. Somewhere I read. So let's just say it started now. All right. So about this time next year, will we see a reduction in rates? I don't know. I would go to the Crystal, you know, Ball Award winner Barry Habib for those uh, for those prognostics. But <laughs> all I can say is, uh, yes, they're going to continue until something happens with inflation. Is that the right answer? Not necessarily. Who knows? But oh. yeah, I think you're probably right. The, the cost of, I, I think, the way the Fed is looking at it is if the the cost of not continuing down the path to Kyle's point the path that they are on right now is causing so many you know tertiary and secondary mm -hmm. negatives the stock market mortgage rates all the negative people that have money in stocks or can't they can't buy a house or affordability um, but I think they fear the the, the potential consequences of not going aggressively down the path. I think right now what we're seeing with the stock and the bond market is a lack of confidence in the Fed. I mean, they were just so, they were still banging the inflation is transitory drum as recently as like December. And, you know, and now they're completely have reversed course. And I think what you're seeing with stocks and bonds is investors saying, we don't trust the Fed. And uh, <laughs> pulling our money. Yeah, I, agree, I agree. Yeah, I agree with sell, that. Rich. Sell, sell. That's a great statement. So we'll see what happens. We'll be tracking it here week to week, as we have been for the last year and a half or so here on the last week in mortgage today. Uh, Cam, arm loans, you're seeing a lot more arm production. Any other trends on new production of note uh, in, in this kind of change climate? We've been in here for a few months. You know, we're starting to see more requests for arms, but the investors really have not gotten on board yet with a, a good quality arm. So those are some things that we're looking for a portfolio. About the only quality arm out there would be, you know, a jumbo, and that's very, very inconsistent among the aggregators. Yeah, I was talking with, Chris, with Rob Crisman about this on our show a couple of weeks ago, and it, you could see why the, uh, the secondary market arm investors you know, ultimately, the people that buy those mortgage-backed securities of arms are cautious right now. The interest rate climate is just so, it's, it's so tumultuous right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, rates have risen up so quickly. You know, if you're, if you're paying a premium for pools of mortgage-backed securities filled with adjustable rate mortgages and rates do go back down into the low fours or the threes because of a recession, Typically during times of economic strife, you're going to see fixed rates drop. It stuff will all pay off. And, you know, you buy those arms hoping like as bank lenders that they get mm -hmm. to that flip date, right? And the rate goes up right. and better on the balance sheet, less interest rate risk. But uh, I don't see, and, and for those reasons, it's going to be, it's going to be tough for the arm secondary markets to, to get to a point where an arm really becomes you know, I think a great deal, but banks will do them, you know, banks are, mm -hmm. I think like you, you guys and our other members, they're trying to figure out what's the right rate to be at. I yeah. don't need to be super low because there is no secondary market, but the bank, it's good for the bank balance sheet. So. Exactly. That's what we're looking at. We're looking at, uh, you know, adding an arm product and then looking at the jumbo arm product as well, but it's got to make sense. You know, you got to make sure your portfolio is not overwhelmed with any one thing, especially jumbo. And uh, yep. a, a dynamic that uh, folks, I guess, wouldn't know about our bank is that our balance sheet, because we don't have a, we have very few consumer loans and we don't have any commercial loans on the Armed Forces Bank side, you know, we have the potential to do a lot more portfolio, whereas on the academy side, we're competing against commercial and consumer. You know, that's where all the HELOCs and everything else comes from. So kind of interesting to note, as a bank, we still have internally some things that we have to work around for balance sheet purposes that's a good position you know, talk to a couple of banks at this kind of conference same way they're kind of starving for earning assets you know maybe don't have a big commercial loan presence uh and it's really really helping them recruit and uh you know keep production coming in you know when when you can when you can put loans on the shelf so right excellent you're just well, stocking those shelves for the next refi boon right <laughs> listen We've said that the refis are done how many times in our 20 some years in the industry? So, so everybody's saying, oh, no refi for the next three, four, five years. 
it's it, history has proven there's always it's another refi be. boom. Always. <laughs> it may not be two and a quarter on a VA, but it, you know, it'll be, it'll definitely be in the low fours and threes, I would assume. Oh, Cam, really uh, always enjoy talking through the business with you, but in sports as well. And I uh, uh, really appreciate you taking some time out to co-host this week. And uh, great seeing you, man. Great seeing you too, Rich. Thanks for the invite. Absolutely. To all of our attendees, thanks as always for joining us. We're here every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern with the last week in mortgage today. Uh, you can find us on YouTube. You can find us on podcast, TMC Connect. That's where the majority of people listen. So if you're not subscribed to our podcast, uh, do so. Apple, Spotify, wherever you're, you get your, your podcast feeds. And uh, until next Tuesday, have a great rest of the week, everyone. Take it easy, Cam. Take care, all.